Hello, and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio, and we thank you very much for joining us today. Now, on the other side of the table from me is Jared. Now, Jared doesn't have one monitor. He doesn't have two monitors. He's got the three-monitor command center going right now. Jared, you, you set up in your command center? I am set up in my command center. I've got my Angry Bird Squishy and my coffee cup. He's got his Angry Bird, he's got his Angry Bird Squeezy, and he's got his coffee cup, so he is ready to go. We are ready to go for yet another episode of Student of the Gun Radio. And like we said, we want to uh, extend a thanks to you guys who are out there listening to us, whether you live in free America or occupied America, or if you live in a foreign country where you're completely and totally occupied, uh, we feel for you, um, and we really love uh, we'd love for you guys to move here and live in free America with us. So, so if you can do it, do it. Now, if you've got the, uh, if you're listening this week and if you've been paying attention to Student of the Gun Radio, you know that we've got some fantastic sponsors. And I want to, Jared, let's let's take a real quick second to address sponsorship. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. All right, Jared has given me permission to address sponsorship. I, I find it kind of strange that um, people somehow think that because you have sponsors, that makes you a sellout. <laughs> hey, Jared, do you like to get paid for your work? I do. I love to get paid. You do? You don't just do it out of the goodness of your heart? Something's got to pay the bills. Well, you know, um, I tried to pay my uh, my mortgage payment with good feelings and unicorn milk, and I found that they wouldn't take it. They, they preferred cash. But, uh, you know, somebody actually uh, commented about how uh, – we we are always promoting our sponsors and we're product driven. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who live in the socialist utopia, l- let's go ahead and readdress the, uh, the issue right now. If you're listening to this, you're either listening to it on iTunes or Stitcher or you're direct podcasting it or streaming it from the internet for free. That's right. It didn't cost you a penny to click the little button to listen to this show. Now, I don't do this for practice. I'm a professional. I've been a professional communicator for over 20 years now. And if you go to work every day, I'm sure that you assume or that you believe that you are a professional as well. You're either professional carpenter, plumber, electrician, lawyer, doctor, what have you. When you go to work every day, do you expect people to pay you for your efforts? Well, I hope so, unless you're some kind of a peace, love, dope, socialist hippie. But if you're a peace, love, dope, socialist hippie, I really doubt that you clicked on a show called Student of the Gun Radio. (laughs) I think if a hippie clicked on Student of the Gun Radio, he would probably go into shock uh, and he'd be in a coma. But uh, Or she could be her in a coma. But uh, yeah, we have some fantastic sponsors and it's because of our sponsors that we're able to buy microphones <laughs> and microphone cables and pop filters so I don't pop my peas and all that good stuff. Now, Crossbreed Holsters of uh, Liberty, Missouri, uh, they're one of our friends. They're one of our, our good sponsors. They've been with us. Crossbreed actually uh, started with Student of the Gun way back in the beginning. Well, it's, I guess not way back, about three years ago. Uh, and my good uh, friend who left me way too soon, Mark Craighead, uh, he was a good friend of mine and he supported Student of the Gun. He He was behind it all the way, and we're really happy to have Crossbreed on as our partner and our sponsor here with Student of the Gun Radio. And then down in the uh, in the Everglade area of uh, Cocoa, Florida, we've got our buddies Keltec Firearms uh, or Keltec Weapons, and those guys they're producing polymer framed, really cool, futuristic weapons. And everybody's mad at them because they're not making them fast enough, but. Ladies and gentlemen, we just visited with them what uh, the first weekend of May. We were in our, at NRA, and the booth was was it elbow to elbow, A to B. It was you couldn't hardly move in the Caltech booth because there were so many people in it every day. It was just swamped. Every, and, and what was funny is we did the book signing there. And Jared's laughing over there because he knows what I'm about to say. You know, we we're doing uh, the student of the gun book signing. And, you know, I don't know, one out of every five, one out of every 10 people would come up and they're like, oh, hey, can I ask you a question? Sure. Where can I find a PMR 30? <laughs> and uh, my standard uh, response was, well, right over there on the table. That's, no, no, no. I, I know it's there. I want to buy one. 
<laughs> like, well, we're not selling guns here at the NRA exhibit, but, uh, uh, you know, and if you guys, if you want a, a PMR 30 or an R, you know, a KSG or an RFB or whatever, dude, you're just going to have to get your name on the list. That's just the way it is. But uh, Crossbreed and Keltec are two of our good friends, and uh, we don't want to forget about Firearms Radio Network, our bandwidth sponsors, and the guys who actually brought us on board and gave us this opportunity to talk to you guys. Now, don't forget, every week we pick a student of the week. And if you are the student of the week, we will send you an official student of the gun t-shirt. That's right. If we read your question on the air, uh, you get a free student of the gun t-shirt just for asking. And you guys have been fantastic. You're asking us all kinds of really good questions. Actually, you put me in a position where it's tough to pick one out of all the questions we get every week, but somebody's got to be picked. Now, Jared, tell us who our student of the week is and what was their question? Our student of the week is Mike Jasierski, and he wants to know, with the shortage of ammo to continue into the unforeseeable future, what is the real-world lifespan of ammo stored in factory boxes and bulk stored in ammo cans? Mike, that's a fantastic question, and I think a lot of people out there in the audience are thinking the exact same thing. You know, I bought a bunch of ammo. I'm storing ammo. I don't know if I'm going to get any more in the near future, or if I do, it's going to be expensive and hard to find. So what is the legitimate shelf life of factory fresh ammo? Well, I put that question to my good friends at uh, Federal Ammunition, and what they came back with, they said, well, our, our standard answer is 10 years shelf life if stored properly. And the big question is, well, what is stored properly? Well, stored properly essentially is what, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's ammo or food or medicine, what do they always tell you? Store in a cool, dry place. Uh, if you keep your, you know, the biggest am enemies of your ammunition are heat and moisture. Uh, if your ammo gets wet, if your ammo is constantly exposed to humidity uh, or heat, it gets hot and cold and hot and cold, that is going to degrade it. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're keeping our ammo dry or free of moisture, and we also need to keep it cool. Now, the heat thing isn't that big of a deal as long as there's not moisture associated with it. Uh, and when I was in the military, one of the things that they told us, and I always thought it was funny, is they said, never store ammunition in direct sunlight. I said, dude, we're, we're in a desert. Uh, we're in a jungle. Where, where do you want me to put it? But uh, if you've got airtight ammo cans, and, and what I would suggest, if you really want to keep your ammo, you want to keep it preserved, you need to, if you're buying it in the normal factory cardboard boxes, take it and put it in some type of an ammo can, some type of an ammunition storage can that has a watertight seal. And if you really want to get fancy, what you can do is put it in an ammo can with a watertight seal and put one of the moisture eaters in there so that it'll take all the moisture out of the, uh, out of the air and out of the atmosphere. There's another company called Z-Core, Z-Core Products. And while we were at the NRA, uh, here two weeks ago, we were introduced to a new product they've got. They actually have an ammo can storage bag where you put you line your ammo can with the storage bag put your bulk ammunition into it and then seal it and the z-core bags they're not just plastic storage bags they're not you know ziploc bags you get from the grocery store these are actually corrosion resistant rust resistant bags and they keep the moisture and the corrosion away from your guns and or ammunition so I guess the answer to your question is most uh, manufacturers will tell you that as long as you don't, you know, store it in, in your wet, damp, nasty basement, that your ammo will last at least 10 years normal shelf life. Now, from a practical standpoint, I can tell you this. I've shot ammunition, surplus ammunition that was manufactured in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, ammo that was, you know, 40 years old, and it all went bang. But there, and the reason it did was because it was stored in airtight ammo cans and then i you know when i opened it and used it then if you if you've got ammo that's constantly ex exposed to the elements well, it's obviously going to degrade faster oh one real quick one and don't forget this guys you want to keep all of your solvents and your cleaning oils away from your ammunition because gun oil clp solvents will 
their primer killers. Uh, so just remember when you're, you know, when you're cleaning your, if you're going to clean your gun, take the ammunition out of that gun, put it away from your cleaning table, uh, and get you so that you don't risk getting things like solvents or oils on your primer. So that is your answer. At least 10 years, keep it dry and keep it, um, cool, cool and dry, and you should be good to go. Okay, you guys can read a calendar. You know what time it is. It's vacation time. It's time when people start planning out their summer vacations. It's almost Memorial Day, and that really is the kick kickoff of what? Of the vacation season. Now, if you are an armed citizen, if you're a student of the gun, if you're a prepared person, you're probably thinking, all right, we're going to go on vacation, and uh, we need to think about being armed on vacation. Now, when you go out, you need to ask yourself this. You need to ask yourself a serious question. If you are an armed citizen, if you legitimately understand that you need to have things to protect your family, to protect your own life, to protect your family, you need to ask yourself this question. Do I want to do it sometimes or do I want to do it all the time? Uh, or even when it's difficult, it, it, it's, you know, that when you're, when you're, the weather is cool and you can wear a cover garment and you're not sweating, it's easy to carry concealed. But what a lot of humans will do is as the temperature goes up, as their clothing gets lighter, they'll either carry less often or they'll carry smaller guns or they won't carry at all. And if you're a person that runs it, you know, and, and it's human nature, but what you have to ask yourself is, Am I really serious about this or am I just playing at self-defense? Do I really want to be prepared all of the time? And if, you know, when it comes to summertime vacation time, you know, how do we go on vacation? Most of us uh, in the summer, we go to places that are warm. That's just what we do. We like to do it. And what does that mean? What does that translate to? Well, it translates to light clothing, shorts, T-shirts, flip-flops, and all that. Well, it's tough to... You know, conceal hardware on yourself when your clothing is really light. And what we want to do right now uh, in this special edition or in this edition of Student of the Gun Radio is let's take time to talk about that. Well, first of all, we're, we're, let's talk about hardware. Let's talk about your actual firearms. You know, what are you going to do? Are, first of all, are you, have you made the decision that even though you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt, you're still going to carry? Some people out there just say, well, I can't because my shorts and t-shirt won't allow it. So I'm just not going to carry today. Or I'll have my wife put my gun in her purse or, <laughs> you know, crazy stuff like that. And, and if that's what you're doing, you're, you're really, you're rolling the dice and your, your question, when you look in the mirror, you have to say, well, am I really serious about this or do I just carry a, a concealed gun just so I can, you know, impress my buddies at the gun shop or am I serious about protecting myself? Well, one of the things that we've, uh, we've had great success with, I've had great success with Jared and we live in the South. We live in Biloxi, Mississippi. And ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, let me tell you what, if you want hot, and humid, come on down here and spend some time with us in the summer because it is hot and humid down here. Uh, a couple of, a couple of years ago, I was introduced to the Crossbreed Super Tuck holster, and yeah, I was not a fan of waistband holsters at the time. I re I really didn't appreciate them. All the in the waistband holsters I'd ever tried up to that point in time, when I was a bodyguard, when I was working as a cop, you know, plain clothes, uh, I found that they. After an hour or two, they were digging on me. You know, I had a hot spot. I was constantly adjusting them back and forth. I could never find a comfortable spot to carry my gun in a waistband holster. So I just gave up on them. I was like, you know what? That's not for me. It's for skinny guys or, or what have you. Well, then when I found the, uh, the super tuck holster, uh, Mark Craighead, my good friend, he told me, he said, look, don't, don't judge it based on one day. He said, you can't just wear it one time and say, oh, this doesn't work for me. He said, you've got to wear it more than that to really appreciate it. And uh, so I, I did. I, and, you know, the, when I got my first holster from Mark, it was probably April or May uh, down here in the south. And I started wearing it. And, uh, you know, to his credit, he was absolutely right. Not only did I find it to be comfortable, but it was comfortable even in the heat. Now, I'll give you guys a clue. I'm going to give you a hint. If you've ever been on the Crossbreed website and you've shopped for their products, you'll know that they offer cow leather, their holsters with a cow leather backing, and also with a horse hide backing. 
Now, the horse hide is more expensive because when you're a manufacturer and you purchase horse hide, it costs a lot more than cow hide. That's, that's why. Spend the extra money on the horse hide. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do nothing else, if you take not one other piece of advice from Paul Markle today, spend the extra 10 or 15 bucks on a horse hide backing, especially if you're going to wear it anywhere where it's going to be warm because the horse hide does two things. Number one, it's, it's a little bit thicker and it protects you, uh, your body from that sweat. It gives you that, the, uh, I guess it protects your gun from your body sweat. It doesn't protect your body from the gun. But uh, it prevents that sweat from building up and getting onto the gun. It reduces it. Now, if you wear it all day, if you put a holster on, you walk around uh, New Orleans in June all day long, you're going to sweat through. That's just the way it is. But uh, spend the money on the horse hide. And the cool thing about the horse hide, and, and all other, but specifically the horse hide, is that after you've worn this holster for a week or two, especially a month, it's going to conform to the shape of your body. It's basically going to mold to you like a good pair of cowboy boots. If you guys out in the audience, you know, if you've ever had a really good pair of boots uh, after a month or two, those things fit your feet perfectly. Well, that's the way the uh, the holster fits. And that's what you're looking for in comfort, in all day long comfort. Now, a waistband holster obviously gives you the added advantage of tucking the gun tighter against your body. And what I found is I've got a I've got a car P45 pistol. It's very thin. It's very compact. It doesn't have any large external controls. I can put that in a crossbreed holster and wear it with shorts and a t-shirt all day long, and nobody is any the wiser because it holds nice and tight against my body. And when it comes to concealed carry, you need to think about that. Is this gun snugged up against my body like it needs to be, or is it pushing out away from my body? A lot of holsters that you'll find, uh, if you go to Academy Outdoors or what have you, and you know there's a, there's a spindle rack or a huge rack full of holsters. You know, you've got nylon holsters, polymer holsters, leather holsters, all these different holsters. And you look at them, and they're like, well, what's the difference? I mean, they all keep the gun from falling on the ground, right? I mean, so I'm just going to buy this this uh, $9.95 made-in-China nylon holster. <laughs> Don't do that. But, uh, the, well, the reason is some holsters are designed just to, keep your, to, put, for, to give you a place to put your gun. That's it. They're not designed for concealment. They're not day, designed for all-day-long carry. They're just... So you can free up your hands. Where do I stick this thing so I can use both my hands? That's Those are utility holsters. There are some holsters that are high quality, but they're range holsters because they stick out away from your body. Now, a uh, you know when, when you're running a competition, these guys that shoot IPSC and, and speed competitions, their holsters are not snugged in tight against their bodies because they want to get to the gun fast. And that's fine, but that requires the holster to stick out away from their bodies. A lot of holsters that you'll find, you know, like I said, at, at Academy or maybe even Walmart or whatever your favorite, you know, store is, they're good utility holsters. But if you look at them, once you put them on, you'll see that they actually stick, the gun sticks out away from your body. Well, you can't conceal all day long, you know, with shorts and a t-shirt with that kind of holster. Does it mean it's a bad holster? No. No, the holster's perfectly fine. It's a utility holster, and that's what it's designed for. But if you're looking for a concealed carry holster, especially one that you can just drape, you know, a loose-fitting T-shirt over, you're going to need one that tucks that gun up against your body. And this is a good time to talk about belts. Ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, when it comes to a gun belt, don't go cheap. You're like, oh, come on, Paul, man. I went in my closet and I've, I've got like eight belts in my closet. I've got brown belts and I've got black belts and I've got tan belts. And uh, folks, the belt that you bought, that your wife bought you from JCPenney to go with your dress slacks, that thing was meant to cinch up your pants. And that is it. That thing was not meant to hold a two pound gun in place for 12 hours. Uh, if you're going to, you know, can, 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 whoop, Three, two, one, let's start that over again. If you're going to carry concealed, you need a quality belt. Spend the money, you won't regret it. Now, there are leather belts and there are good nylon belts, uh, and either ones will, will work, but you have to think, if you're spending $5 on a belt, what you're going to get is a $5 belt. 
<laughs> don't think, oh, I, I, this one's on sale and it's only four ninety nine at, at JC Penny or what have you. So that that'll be good. No, it won't be good. What's going to happen is you're going to be out away from your house doing your business. You're going to have your gun on. The belt's going to break, and you're going to be standing there with a broken belt and wondering how that happened. And I can tell you that that happened to me because when I was a young puppy, you know, just fresh out of the police academy, um, I actually got my first professional bodyguard job. And I had a leather belt that was the same color as the holster I was wearing. And it, you know, came from, I don't know, Sears, JC Penney's, wherever. And I thought, oh, that's good enough. No, it wasn't because I was on a, a detail and about 2 a.m. the belt broke. Now, fortunately, I had another one in my suitcase, but it was an awkward situation. Don't put yourself in that situation. And not only is it you're worried about it breaking, but comfort. If you're going to carry, you know, carrying a gun, you say, oh, it's only one pound. When's the last time you put one or two pounds of metal on your hip, on your right or left hip and carried it around all day long? Probably not very often, right? Or at least not comfortably. It, a quality belt makes all the difference in the world. So if you're going to, you know, buy, if you're going to carry a waistband holster, uh, an IWB, an over the hip, what have you, you need to mate that up with a quality belt. Other options. What are some of the other options that you can get away with? Well, pocket carry. Now we talked about pocket carry previously on student of the gun and I'm, I'm not against it. However, asterisk caveat, if you're going to put a gun in your pocket, put it in a pocket holster or a pocket scabbard. We don't drop guns naked into our pockets and carry them like that. That is a recipe for disaster for several reasons. Number one, the trigger is not covered. If you just drop it into your pocket, the trigger is not covered. Number two, if you do it every day, your gun is going to be so full of lint within a week that you it probably isn't going to function properly. And number two, and number three, it also will print. If you put a gun in the pocket of your favorite pair of khaki, khaki slacks or shorts or what have you, and it's just, you know, J frame or a pocket nine or pocket 380 or whatever, eventually you're going to have a perfect, the perfect outline of that gun in the pocket. Even when the gun's not in the pocket, it's going to look like it's there and it's going to wear through the pocket liner. Cause folks, the liners of your, the, the, pockets of your clothes, your shorts and pants, they weren't designed to have an 11 ounce or a 13 ounce piece of metal carrying in them all the time every day. It just doesn't work like that. So eventually what will happen is it will wear through the pocket liner and then your favorite pocket pistol will be down around your ankle. You'll be kicking it across the floor because it just ripped through your pocket. So and, and pocket holsters, folks, they're not expensive. I mean, they're pretty darn simple. Uh, the the fact that people would go and spend two hundred and eighty nine dollars on the latest coolest pocket pistol, and then not spend twelve dollars on a pocket scabbard, to me is is ridiculous. It's it's crazy talk. Uh, so spend the extra money, jeez Louise. Uh, a lot of our good friends make uh, pocket holsters. Blackhawk makes pocket holsters. Uh, who else makes a good? Oh, Tough Products. Tough Products makes a really good pocket scabbard that they call the Pocket Roo. Uh, so check those out and, you know, spend, if you're going to carry a gun every single day, what is $15 divided up over 365? You know, 365 days, not very much, but uh, when it comes to, you know, keeping the gun secure and, and another thing, number four, the fourth reason to use a pocket scabbard or a pocket holster is it keeps the gun from moving around in your pocket. You know, if you've got a pocket 380, like the, the Diamondback or the kel you know, the kel P380, what have you, and you've got a big loose pocket, that thing's going to turn all, you know, every which way in your pocket during the day as you're moving around. You don't you don't want that when you reach in your pocket to grab it when it's go time you want to be able to just grab it pull that out and do what you need to do you don't want to pull it out upside down or sideways or what have you it's just silliness so you know spend the money get yourself a quality pocket holster now what about other types of carry methods we've got the uh, the ankle holster ankle holsters are kind of a you know, they're not a catch 22 so much, but they're, they're a double edged sword. No, well, one, you know, an ankle holster, number one, you can't wear it in shorts unless you want to look really weird on the beach. But, uh, they, they offer you a, a solution where another solution might not work. Specifically, let's say you're wearing very nice dress slacks and you have to wear dress slacks. 
and you can't you, you can't get away with wearing a gun concealed because it's just not going to work. So what do you do? You use an ankle holster. Now, ankle holsters are fantastic for people that are sitting down because think about it. If you're sitting down right now, you take your right hand, reach down, touch your left ankle. Huh, I bet you're able to do it really easily, weren't you? That's right. It's right there and it's easy to get to. Now, ankle holsters, if you've never carried on the ankle, uh, it's going to be kind of a weird deal. You're going to, you're going to feel like there's the first time you do it, you're like, man, I'm always aware of it. I, I feel it there. It's, it's all, it's kind of bothers me. It's, it's natural because you know, you haven't had that. Spend the money on a quality ankle holster. Get one from a reputable manufacturer. And it should have, it should have some type of padding. A lot of the good uh, makers will put a wool, kind of like a, a, a yellow, tan wool material between your body and the holster because you don't, the last thing you want is the cylinder of a J-frame banging against your ankle bone 12 hours a day. Not comfortable. Uh, so, you know, pot, or, um, ankle holsters can be a good solution. Now, you need to practice with them and you need to know what you're doing. You need to get used to them. Uh, the, the trick with, with all these different types of carry is uh, if, if you change up your method of carry every single day, and you need to get that gun in a crisis, you end up playing the frisk yourself game. You know, where is my gun today? Yesterday it was on my ankle. Today it's in my front right pocket. Tomorrow it's going to be over my hip. You know, where is my gun today? You want to find a way that's going to work for you. For instance, like let's say, you know, you live in the South. You live in Florida or Mississippi, Alabama, what have you. And, you know, from from May till October, it's hot every day. You know, I can tell you guys that uh, down here, you know, essentially from May to October, unless I'm working or doing something professionally, I'm in shorts and a T-shirt. That is my everyday dress. And so what I've had to do is I have to adapt my method of carry for shorts and T-shirt weather. And it's not hard to do. It just requires a little bit of effort on your part. Now, let's talk about other things on vacation. Folks say, well, where I'm going, I'm not allowed to carry or I'm forbidden to or they won't allow me or it's against the law. Well, everybody has choices to make in their life. And if you choose to go to a place to travel to a city where you are forbidden the ability to protect yourself, that is the choice that you have made, and you are going to live or die with that choice. Now, you say, well, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to die, you know, just because I go to New York and, and I'm completely disarmed. No, you might not. Why do we carry handguns? Why do we have fire extinguishers? Why do we have first aid kits? Is it because we hope there's going to be a fire? We hope someone's going to get injured. We hope that someone's going to attack us. No, it's the exact opposite. We have all those items because we don't know. When you wake up in the morning, you put your feet on the floor and you begin your day. You have no idea what you're going to encounter that day. And that is the whole reason that we prepare ourselves. And if you are of the mindset that you're willing to be disarmed frequently or, you know, even occasionally, then that is the choice that you have to make. Now, I like to live my life prepared. And when someone tells me that I have to be disarmed in the interest of safety, my big question is, whose safety are you concerned with? It's certainly not my safety. Are you concerned about the safety of the street criminal? I mean, that's what I would ask Bloomberg if he was in the same room with me. I'd say, whose safety are you concerned with? Are you concerned with my safety or the safety of the uh, the street corner criminal? Because apparently it's not my safety. Oh, that's, you need to leave that up to the professionals. Okay, so the state is responsible. I got you. All right, moving on. But uh, you know, if you're going to an area where they tell you you can't be armed or you're forbidden to be armed, yeah, I would rethink it. And I would say, well, and ask yourself this. What are you going to do when you're on vacation? Are you taking your wallet with you? I bet you're going to be spending some money, aren't you? Why would you go to an area that feels that you are a peasant and must be disarmed and willfully give them your money? Yes, thank you for disarming me. Here is my money. What? That doesn't make sense in my world. It might make sense in your world. Hey, and if it does, drive on. But uh, I would think about it. You know, well, I'm going to Chicago and, and I'm forbidden to carry or own a gun or anything. You say, well, why are you giving Chicago your money? Why are you giving New York your money? 
Is, are those the only places on the planet that you can visit? Visit somewhere in free America. Give those guys your money. Now, what else should we carry when we're armed? Well, obviously, you never want to put yourself in a position where all you have is your empty hands and a gun. You know, if you put yourself in a position where all you ever have is your empty hands and a gun, you're putting yourself in a bad position because, number one, you, you're – could be in a position where you don't feel that it is a deadly force situation. For instance, the 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 guy in the parking lot, he's like, "Hey, buddy, hey, buddy, what? Hey, you got five bucks, man? You got five bucks? No. Well, come on, man, you got five bucks. Are you going to shoot that guy? You going to pull out your gun and say, "Get away from me'?" Probably not. And you probably, A, won't want to do that because you won't want to draw attention to yourself. But also, you may not yet be convinced in your own mind that that person is a deadly threat. However, if somebody's in the parking lot and they're like, hey, buddy, give me five bucks. Hey, buddy, give me five bucks. You need to deal with that. You can't just wish them away. Well, how are you going to do that? You need to have something between yourself and empty hands. And I've had people say, I actually had a guy tell me, he's like, dude, I'm pretty good with my hands. I'm no problem. Okay, you may be really good with your hands. You may be, you know, a golden glove boxer or a jujitsu expert or what have you. But think about it like this. If you have a gun on your body, if you carry concealed and you get into a physical altercation with someone, you get into a punching match and how, what, what happens? What do, how do fights, they start as fist fights and they end up where? On the ground. Every fight you've ever seen in the schoolyard, in the parking lot, anywhere starts with everyone standing up, ends with everyone on the ground. Do you really want to be wrestling with a potential bad person? While, with a gun on. Is that where you want to be in life? No. You want to stay away from that situation. So how do we do that? Well, we put something between our empty hands and our gun, such as a quality pepper spray product, oleo resin capsicum, dudes and dudettes. I've sprayed in excess of 300 individuals with pepper spray. And let me tell you what, it works. It is the gift that keeps on giving. Now, uh, are there people on planet Earth that it will not affect? Yes. Yes, there are. Are there people who have been shot with handguns and continue to do bad things? Yes. Does that mean we shouldn't carry handguns? No. What it means is that it's there are no miracle cures. However, if you have pepper spray and you're able to juice somebody with the pepper spray, they will generally leave you alone unless they are a deadly threat. If they desire to be a deadly threat, then that will materialize and you know it's time to not have the pepper spray anymore and to replace it with a handgun. But, uh, you know, the annoying drunk or the, or the street, the street corner guy that won't leave you alone. Hey, man, come on, man. You know you got some money. Come on. You know you got some money. Well, his hands are empty, and you don't feel like you're justified in shooting him, but this dude is not going to get away from you. Pull out your pepper spray. Say, stop, get away, and if he comes forward, spray him. Well, am I justified? I don't know. Have you gone through my justifiable use of force class? Have you paid attention? What do you think? If this guy approaches you, do you feel that you are in fear of some form of harm? If the answer is yes, then you're lawfully allowed to use pepper spray on him. Or you say, well, I'm not really sold on pepper spray, Paul. I don't believe you. Okay, don't believe me. Other things, what else can we use? Well, there's a civilian taser. Now, the civilian taser works very, very well. It is an extremely effective tool. Asterisk, it is also very expensive. Uh, the civilian taser is around $300. And I think you could probably get 30 cans of pepper spray for $300. So you have to ask yourself, am I willing to spend that money? Now, keep in mind, you know, any of these tools, if you choose to carry them, you may go into a jurisdiction where it is illegal. And you have to ask yourself, why am I going there? Now, the, the taser is kind of a weird animal. Some, some uh, jurisdictions view them on the low end like pepper spray or mace or what have you. And then some other jurisdictions view them on the high end, such as in Mississippi, actually, it's strangely enough, in order to carry a taser concealed on your body, according to the uh, the statute, you have to have a concealed carry permit. 
If you want to conceal a taser gun or any type of electronic subject control device or stun gun on your body, you have to have a concealed carry permit. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have it on the, you know, your, the bedside dresser or on the, the front seat of your car, but you need to understand things like that. What else could we use? Flashlights. Flashlights are excellent deterrents. Number one, you shine it in their face and you say, stop. If they keep going and you've got a good light, you give them a knock on the bridge of their nose and you readjust their attitude. Works very, very well. The end of that story is don't ever put yourself in a position where all you have is empty hands and a gun because there's really no need for it. So armed on vacation, our armed on vacation checklist, where am I going? Am I allowed to possess tools that I can use to defend myself and my family while I'm on vacation? If the answer is no, you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? I don't know. That's you. Everyone makes decisions. They live and die by those decisions. Number two, is my method going to work in light clothing? If I go out on the beach, if I'm, you know, walking down the boardwalk in flip flops and shorts and and t-shirt, am I going to be able to legitimately conceal my gun comfortably so that I do it all the time? All right. What do I have to support my firearm? Do I have a flashlight? Do I have pepper spray or some type of alternate use of force tool? And, you know, those are really the the basics before you step out of your house. Just because you go on vacation doesn't mean you should leave your defensive mindset at home. You need to take your defensive mindset with you wherever you go. All right, you folks know that we were at the uh, NRA annual uh, meeting and exhibits. We've already talked about that. But while we were there, we talked to uh, a couple of friends of ours, Scott Moore and Tammy Mowry, and they are with the Scholastic Pistol Program. And if you folks are not aware of the Scholastic Pistol Program, let me take a moment and uh, let make you aware of it. Now, if you want to find out all the details, you can go to www.shootshoot sctp.org and we'll put the link up for you guys on the student of the gun radio site but uh, student scholastic pistol program is like the scholastic uh, clay target program it is for young people it is a way for young people to get involved in the shooting sports and enjoy themselves what they've done is they've modeled the scholastic pistol program after the steel challenge so you have reactive steel targets uh, you, the kids start out you know from a designated position and then they have to go through different uh, different scenarios, different uh, different types of shooting uh, equations. Now, Scott and Tammy uh, have been fantastic. They're getting a lot of kids involved in it. And the re- at where I first met Scott Moore actually was up at the Ohio 4-H shooting sports camp a couple of years ago. It was the guys at the Scholastic Pistol Program and Scott and their, our, their friends at Smith & Wesson that actually helped the 4-H start their new action pistol program. And that's another, you know, we talk about 4-H a lot, and that's because I like 4-H, and I think that they're a fantastic program, and you really should support them as well. But the Scholastic Pistol Program is nationwide. Uh, They're actually gearing up for, I believe they're having their nationals here very soon. But you can go to their website. You can check them out and find out more about them. And if there's a Scholastic Pistol Program in your area or you're looking to get your young people, you know, kids 12 to 18, if you want to get them involved in the shooting, sports, the Scholastic Pistol Program or the uh, Scholastic uh, Clay Target Program might be a good place for you to get your kids involved. And if you're an older guy who's got grown kids and you're like, man, I would really like to help out, I'm sure that they would like to hear from you. So uh, check them out. Check out the Scholastic Pistol Program. And like I said, it's shootsctp.org. So you can check those guys out on the website right there. Now, in addition to vacation season, what is the 1st of June? Well, the 1st of June is hurricane season. Yay. Well, no, not yay, but what do we what does that mean to us? Well, what it means to us, anybody who lives in a state that borders an ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, when June 1st comes around, that is time for you to go and look in your cupboard 
You know, look in your pantry, check your uh, fuel supply, check, you know, go out, fire your generator up, make sure that it's working properly. Uh, how much water do we have on hand and so forth? It, it's what we essentially call storm preparation. Now, down here in the south, we have hurricane season, so we're always prepared for hurricanes. And if you live somewhere who, that is not in the south, you may have deadly tornadoes. You may have earthquakes. You may have wildfires. You may have ice storms. Uh, regardless of where you live on planet Earth, you are subject to violent weather events at some point in time. And as a student of the gun, student of the gun, remember, it's not just about shooting. It's about being a prepared citizen. It's about being able to take care of yourself and take care of your family. And one of the ways we do that is through storm preparation. Now, when we say storm preparation, people like to use the term prepper. Uh, that That is the cool modern vernacular, you know, prepper. Uh, and it kind of makes me laugh because, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to uh, – remember uh, back in the, the 70s, uh, in the 70s and 80s, and when I was a kid, and my mother and my grandmothers, you know, every spring, my mom would be out planting a garden. You know, every spring she'd plant a garden, and, you know, every fall, I can remember my mom and my grandmothers, you know, they're in the kitchen, and they got the, the pots and the boiling water and the jars and everything, and, and they're canning food. And they put it up in the pantry or the fruit cellar or whatever we had. Well, if, if you, you know, if you saw someone doing that today, people today, you know, would say, Oh, that, that person is a prepper. They're a doomsday prepper. <laughs> I don't think my mom and my grandmothers were doomsday preppers, uh, back in the sixties and seventies and eighties even. They weren't doomsday preppers. They just knew that, Hey, guess what? Everyone in this house needs to eat every day. Whether or not there's a snowstorm or a thunderstorm or a tornado or a hurricane, they still need to eat every single day. That's just how human beings are. And, you know, our parents and our grandparents, they knew that. It wasn't about some wild, paranoid conspiracy theory that, uh, oh, you know, the government, whatever. No, it was, we're humans. We need to eat all the time. And, and, so your your mothers and grandmothers and and what have you they planted gardens and they canned food and they you know stocked the pantry that's just how you lived and it it it's kind of uh it bothers me that that we've devolved as a society to the point where people don't even concern themselves with the proper storage of food in their homes you know that that uh Somehow that if, if you buy bulk food or you store food in your home that that you are some kind of how paranoid or you're crazy or, or you know, you're a weird person. It's like uh, having food in your house is probably one of the most greatest necessities you'll ever have. It's not a paranoid conspiracy theory. So, but how do we do that? Well, number one, there's, there's lots of ways that you can store food in your house that, uh, where it will last a long time. Uh, if what I would suggest you guys do, get on the, uh, the Google machine there and type in the word nine foods that'll, you know, outlive you or nine foods that last forever. And there's actually several websites that'll tell you, uh, and uh, rice is one of them, corn, sugar, honey, uh, so forth. There, there's certain foods that if, just like ammo, if they're stored properly, if you keep them dry and cool and keep them out of the moisture and keep the bugs out of them, uh, will last as long as you are alive. Now, you're not just going to want to eat white rice. You know, if, if there's a hurricane, you're going to get really bored eating white rice every day uh, for a week, two weeks, three weeks. You want to have other things. Uh, what what else can you do? MREs, military MREs are fantastic. Uh, caveat, they're also very expensive comparatively. And you know, when you're talking about feeding four or five people, you feed four or five people with MREs every meal of every day, and you're talking, you know, $100 a day to feed them. That is pretty expensive. The great thing about MREs, though, is a, a, a genuine military MRE. Now, when you go to the camping stores and the, the surplus stores and what have you, what I've noticed here lately is they have what they call civilian MREs or emergency ration MREs. And they're essentially just put together. They put uh, a main meal and then they throw a bunch of – it looks to me – I picked up one and it had a clear, uh, clear plastic bag. 
And it looked like they'd taken an MRE main meal and then a bunch of like Kentucky fried chicken condiment packets and put them in there, you know, a little fork and salt and pepper and a spoon and a, you know, grape jelly or something crazy like that, uh, or a packet of a little packet of saltine crackers. Uh, so uh, there's a big difference between what they call these emergency civilian MREs and a genuine military MRE. Now the, the military meal ready to eat when it comes to, you know, emergency or survival, the great thing about those is they're packed full of calories and human beings in outdoor rough emergency type situations, your body needs a lot of calories to survive. And that's why they put those in there. Now, if you're just sitting around on your porch, you don't need to eat three MREs a day. If you eat three MREs a day and all you ever do is just sit in an easy chair, fanning yourself, you're going to get fat because you, your body will not burn up all those calories. Uh, you can easily, in an emergency situation, take one MRE and divide it um, uh, between two different two people. So you've got MREs. Now, MREs, uh, they will stay, I believe the MRE shelf life from manufacturer is about 10 years. Now, it's 10 years if you just take them, put them in a box, stick them up on a shelf somewhere. If you take MREs and you stick them in your deep freeze, they'll last for not forever, but pretty darn close to forever. So if you wanted to do that, if you're really serious about uh, storm preparedness or preparing for a long-term power outage or what have you, you could legitimately take MREs, put them in your zero deep freeze, and then when the power goes out, you just pull them out and let them thaw, and they'll be good to go. Uh, other products such as uh, Wise Food, there's a company called Wise Food Products, and uh, MREs, they can be... Less than tasty, I guess. Uh, so, you know, you might have kids that are like, "Oh, Dad, MREs are gross. They're nasty." Uh, the Wise Food products, we we tested out some with Student of the Gun. We actually did a video segment on the TV show uh, about Wise Food products, and uh, they're really good, aren't they, Jared? They are. They're they're really good. <laughs> well, I cooked up, uh, you know, one of their meals and fed it to the kids and they wolfed it down. I barely got any of it. So, uh, you know, wise food products, uh, it's good tasting food. The issue with wise products is they're, is they're dehydrated. They're real, they're real, very, very lightweight and they're easy to store. However, when it's time to cook one, unlike an MRE, an MRE, you just open it and eat it immediately. You don't need to do anything to it. You don't need to cook it. You don't need to hydrate it or anything. Uh, with the wise food products, you will need to have clean water which you need to have anyway, uh, and you'll need to put boiling water in them so that they can rehydrate, and then you eat them. So that's something to think about. And so rather than just do one of those, you know, rather than just say, well, I've got cases of MREs or I've got, you know, bins full of white rice and honey and sugar and or I'm going to do wise food, well, why not do a little bit of all of it? Why not have some MREs that you can put in a go bag? So if we have to grab this pack and run out of the house, at very least we'll have food with us. And you can take the, you know, the wise food, the real dehydrated stuff, and you can store lots and lots of those in a cabinet because they take up very little space and they're lightweight. And then, you know, you have your basic staples. You have your rice, your sugar, your corn, things of that nature. And then, of course, don't forget canned foods. Uh, canned foods are fantastic, but they're heavy. So, you know, mix it all up. You you don't have to be a doomsday prepper to have food in your house, uh, to have your family prepared. It's just it's just called being a good citizen. And as we've talked about before on the show, you've got a choice to make. If there is a man-made or natural disaster, your choice is to either be part of the solution or part of the problem. And depending on what you've done up to that point in time, whether you've prepared yourself or whether you haven't, you're either going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. And uh, down here on the Gulf Coast, you know, when a hurricane's brewing out there in, in the in the Gulf of Mexico, you, we have you have a uh, a question. You know, there's a choice to make. Do we want to ev load everybody up in the car and be like you know evacuees or refugees and drive north and and be part of the problem and you say well us you're not really part of the problem well dude if, if you pile 10,000 people into a small town that that you know has 800 hotel beds 
you're part of the problem uh, or do you want to be part of the solution? And, and it's up to you. It's up to each individual out there listening to the sound of my voice to decide, make that decision. Human beings have decisions to make and you can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. And being part of the solution is to have food and water, clean drinking water, kind of important. You know, it, it's 2013 and we have iPhones and computers and the internet, but guess what? Try and go 24 hours without clean water and see how your life is. And uh, it, it's funny how quickly society can devolve from this new modern digital age. Shut the lights out for 48 hours and see what happens. So prepare yourself today, not tomorrow. If you're, you know, if you're listening to this and you go to your pantry and all you have is like a jar of pickles and some Taco Bell sauce packets, uh, it's time to get your butt to the store. <laughs> now, a lot of the material that we talk about here on the Student of the Gun radio program, uh, we also d- go into great detail on Student of the Gun TV and on the website. And if you guys are not taking advantage of that, you're really shortchanging yourself. All you have to do is go over to studentofthegun.com. And I want to make sure that everyone out here who's listening is aware, not only do we put the uh, the shows up on the main page, you go to the main page, watch the weekly show, whatever show is current. But we also have an archives page. So if you've missed one, uh, if we've talked about something previously and you're like, oh, man, I missed that show, you can go to the archives button, just click on it, and you can watch the archives. And, of course, because of the magic of the modern Internet, all these programs are available 24 hours a day for your viewing pleasure just because we like you guys. So don't forget to check out studentofthegun.com for articles and the show, and you can watch our homerooms. And if you want to be a student of the week, if you are excited about the program, and oh, speaking of student of the week, one thing I want you guys to be aware of, if you're, if you posted a question, he said, man, I put a question up and you didn't pick me for the student of the week. And that kind of bums me out. Well, what we've been doing is when it's time to do the student of the gun homeroom material uh, and the postings, what we'll quite often do is we'll go to the student of the gun Facebook page and uh, we'll pick the questions and the topics and we'll use those as our homeroom topics or on the TV show. And there may have been a question. A lot of times you folks, you'll ask a question and they, it's already been answered. We've answered it either via one of the articles on Student of the Gun, or we've answered it in one of the one of the shows, or we answered it on homeroom segment. So take the time to familiarize yourself with all those. We, we Jared is over there, and believe it or not, Jared is one hardworking dude. He's constantly putting up new material. He's editing the radio show. He edits the TV show as well. So he's a busy guy, and he's doing all that work for you guys. So don't, don't make him feel like he's, you know, doing it for nothing. Take advantage of it. Now, folks, we certainly do appreciate you joining us today for Student of the Gun Radio. We thank you guys for all of your support. You fans out there, whether you're listening to us directly from the, uh, the website or Stitcher or iTunes, you're great. Uh, if you are uh, a fan on iTunes, uh, we would ask you to just take a moment and rate the show. If you like the show, tell your friends, give us a rating, because obviously iTunes very closely tracks that stuff. And if you like just listening from the uh, from the um direct uh, download or streaming from the internet or from our website that's fantastic too we appreciate you being out there for us now remember you are a beginner once but you should be a student for life 